Uh, well, good morning, uh, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, CSIS uh, into today's uh, discussion, an insider's perspective on Afghanistan. Um, uh, we're, we're very, very uh, honored to have uh, two uh, very distinguished uh, individuals to discuss this issue. Um, my name is uh, Rick Ozzie Nelson, and I'm the uh, director of the, the Counterterrorism and Homeland Security Program here at uh, CSIS, uh, and a modest role of, of moderating the, these two distinguished individuals. Uh, just to give you a, a quick overview of how we're, how this is going to work today, um, I'm going to interview uh, Dr. Uh, I'm sorry, introduce Dr. Atash first. He'll give his remarks, and then I'll uh, go ahead and introduce. Uh, uh, Roy Goodman, and um, he'll give his remarks, and then we'll go ahead and, and go to questions. Um, before we get started, though, I'd, I'd like to ask uh, all of you to just check, make sure your cell phones and, and pagers and what are off, or at least in vibrate mode. Um, and then when we ask questions, we're going to have individuals with microphones here. Um, please um, limit your questions to questions and not statements. Um, I'll be a very hard moderator, so it's be the question and answer period as opposed to the statement and answer period. Um, and uh, we'll have microphones. Please say who you are and what your affiliation is um, that helps uh, us understand, um, you know, uh, the dialogue of, of the, uh, the context of the questions. So, uh, without further ado, I'll get right into this. Um, our first speaker today, and both these individuals have uh, have published books, um, is Dr. Uh, Nadir Atash. Dr. Atash was born in Kabul. Um, he attended uh, the American University in Beirut and then returned to Kabul. Um, where he served in the Ministry of Education Science Center, where he was the head of the Chemistry and Research Department. So he was a scientist by trade. Um, he then went to the United States and uh, received a master's in science at Claremont and a PhD um, from Florida State, uh, and then stayed in the United States and worked as an educator and a statistician, uh, both for the uh, state of uh, South Carolina and with a, with a, uh, with a company called Westat. Um, from there, and this is what I found one of the most intriguing parts about his bio, he launched a chain of automotive uh, lube shops. I'm trying to figure out how that fits into the whole thing, but uh, and he also started his own consulting firm, uh, uh, Parsa. Um, Dr. Atash has been a well-known activist among the uh, Afghan uh, diaspora supporting numerous organizations in the areas of sports and uh, culture and education. In uh, 1999, he uh, founded the uh, Noristan Foundation, uh, a nonprofit organization uh, dedicated to rebuilding rural areas in, in Afghanistan. After the September 11th attacks, uh, he returned to Afghanistan um, to help with the reconstruction efforts and to serve as a bridge between the United States and his, and his birth country of Afghanistan. Uh, and he, we're there, he established the uh, Afghan American Chamber of Commerce and established the office of, of Kabul. Uh, and then in 2005, after serving um, as a senior advisor to the Ministry of Finance in Afghanistan, he was asked by the Minister of Transportation to serve um, as an advisor in that capacity as, as well. And then, as with most uh, overachievers, no good deed goes unpunished. Um, he was then asked uh, uh, with the great honor of serving as the president of Ariana Airlines um, and did that for a, a small uh, uh, but very influential period of time. Uh, in fact, he uh, was responsible for attracting one of the largest largest uh, uh, private investments uh, into Afghanistan in its history. Um, and he returned to the United States since 2006, and then from there, the uh, last three years, obviously, he's a, a well-known uh, expert on Afghanistan and uh, an educator, entrepreneur, and an activist, and uh, has appeared in uh, you know TV and media and numerous conferences. And he's here today to talk about his new book, uh, Turbulence, the uh, tumultuous journey of one man's quest for change in Afghanistan. So uh, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Dr. Ntosh. Because I may read yours. <laughs> you don't want to read that. <laughs> yeah. uh, good morning. Uh, it's great to be here with you th this morning, and especially I'd like to thank the CIS uh, people and folks to hosting this conference and this event. Uh, and I like to be uh, short on target. Usually I, I, I'm not on time in terms of timing, so if I go overboard, you can stop me. Uh, I'm here to discuss basically uh, the book, but uh, I just don't want to talk about the book because the book is one tool f in my uh, uh, chest of tools to talk about Afghanistan and what we should do. Um, so although the focus is the, 
is my, the book Turbulence, but uh, I'm going to be a little bit more uh, broader in my presentation here with you, but, but certainly I welcome you to read the book and then we can uh, have a conversation about the book. Uh, let me start you know, by saying that the turbulence is uh, a true story about Afghanistan told from two perspectives. Uh, a boy which basically myself and an airline. And it's interesting how the um, paths of these two entities crisscross and, and of course at that time I didn't know this but um, and then eventually um, the paths overlap and it gives rise to some interesting and intriguing stories. Um, in the book I tried to portray what Afghanistan was in those days when I grew up. And so um, a sort of three distinct periods in Afghanistan are um, basically portrayed in the book. Let me see. How do I? Okay. Um, the first period, which is um, the golden age for Afghanistan in, in is from the 50s onwards till 78 is what I uh, call the, uh, the period of uh, progress in Afghanistan. And in this period, there are many episodes in the book um, depicting how Afghanistan was achieving its goals. Um, not only in terms of the country, but in terms of individuals. And, and I gave my example uh, of my life story in those days and for institutions and infrastructure. And, uh, and as a whole, the country was, was moving in the right direction. Given the fact that those, those achievements and progress uh, were made with meager and scarce resources. It's very, uh, I think, uh, critical to understand that, that how um, achievement can be made possible if you have the right leadership and the people uh, are on, on the same line, in the same tune with the government, working together to achieve the goals uh, of the nation. And um, given the brevity of time, I'm not going to elaborate too much on this, so move forward to the second period, which is a period of, uh, well, by the way, we have some pictures from the book from each period. This is uh, um, basically a picture you know, of, of my childhood in the center when I was, I think, about five years old uh, with my mother in the background and, and the family portrait in 1965. I just returned from the uh, U.S. as an exchange student. Uh, I think I'm right in the back. Uh, um, and this is basically uh, when I we graduated from high school uh, um, with my friend who is a medical doctor here in this country, Dr. Ahad, uh, the one on, the, on your left. And well, um, this picture is with my father as, when I was leaving for uh, my AUB scholarship, I basically. Um, in 1972, I got a scholarship to go to Claremont. This is my wife. In those days, you know, that was but the fashion. So. <laughs> and uh, that's uh, uh, in the conference in Singapore. I'm the first one there on the, on the right uh, on science and technology uh, in the area. In and this is in 1982 when I was receiving my actually diploma. I had graduated in 80, but I didn't fill up the forms. I got my, my PhD diploma in 82. And also for the airline, you can see um, the differences between 95 and, and 1960s. You know, you can see the people with beards, you know, shabby kind of uh, things had changed in that era. Anyway. And then we go to the, this uh, era of, of really the great era of devastation for Afghanistan, starting with the Soviet uh, invasion, actually the communist takeover in 1978 till uh, 2001, where all the devastation in Afghanistan occurred, starting with the Soviet in invasion, uh, where the jihad that ensued to, to purge the, you know, get the Soviets out of Afghanistan, 
more than, uh, of course, the estimates are, are, are uh, estimates about 1.5 million Afghans died in that struggle. Uh, more than 5 million Afghans had to leave the country. And we have close to 1 million Afghans who are disabled, maimed, and so forth as a result of that. So the, it was huge devastation in that uh, era. And not, I don't think that any Afghan uh, has escaped the, the negative effects of that era. For example, in my case, and I put, uh, st tell my story, I was in the US just a few months before the coup uh, to uh, work on my PhD at Florida State. So I should have escaped that, that devastating effects. That wasn't the case. And how much of an effect it had on me personally, because my family, um, all my male members of my family were in prison. Four of my br uh, brothers, my f father it was executed. And with a, with a lot of other friends, and I, every day we, hear, we heard of, of these um, um, devastations. And, and the whole country was going through a process that was um, very, very much um, negative. And, and of course, it didn't stop after the Soviets withdrew. It continued even uh, worse in some cases, the civil wars of the 1990s, and then uh, uh, the, the Taliban takeover and all the atrocities that were committed by the jihadis and the Taliban on the Afghan people. Um, for example, this picture, which is in, this, um, in the book, is my daughter, my third daughter, Samira, standing in front of our house, family house, which was a beautiful compound in those days when we were living, at least for us, it had orchards and other things, but you can see that there were. So this is an example of uh, that devastation. And this is an, an, a document that basically um, we found through um, uh, you know, back channels that show how the communists, you know, when they were executing my father and some of my, our relatives, and, uh, uh, that there's a document and it's in the book. So um, now I just want to move fast so that we, are, we don't run short of time. Then we, uh, in the book, I discuss this area of the, the era of turbulence for Afghanistan, which is after uh, the fall of Taliban. And, and of course, in that um, period, Afghanistan started with high hopes after Taliban's were defeated by the Afghan forces and the U.S. and, and NATO, uh, hopes were set very high for uh, reconstruction, democratization, and, and prosperity for Afghanistan. Um, and, and great progress was made initially. From 2001 to 2005, I think we were on the right tracks and we made a lot of progress. But somewhere, uh, you know, things changed. And that's why the turbulence, you know, that we move up and, you know, it's not a um, one-way movement, it's up and down movement in this era. And we have been on this de uh, deterioration course since um, 2005, and, and I think still we are in that process. I have not seen positive effects, even though uh, the U.S. military has recently announced that we have seen some positive uh, um, achievements, and I don't believe in that unless I see really uh, on, the, on the criteria that are important for us, not just getting marja or, you know, it's very easy to capture. The Soviets did this every day, they captured the places. Uh, but to sustain that, to hold that, and, and, and to make sure that the population is not turning against uh, us, that's, those are the real criteria for success. But um, the question is, why did we move from our initial success to, to basically um, this course that, that is, we are following now, the deterioration? Um, this picture uh, is something that I want to show because um, in my, one of the reasons, I think, is that we don't listen to Afghans. Although I heard some good things from my friend, uh, Mr. Gutman, who was in Afghanistan, he said that now the U.S. military has changed its ways recently and are listening to Afghans, but I, I have to see the results. So, um, in my mind, it's that thing is still in formation. But we need to listen to Afghans. If you are there to help Afghanistan, 
if that's the purpose, it makes sense to listen to Afghanistan and then uh, set goals, aspirations, and uh, uh, based on an Afghan view, not something that we go and, and, and uh, uh, just uh, uh, based on our preconceived notions and say, okay, this is what we want to do in Afghanistan. And a lot of this, the f uh, reason that uh, we are losing the people from 95% now to 68% based on the uh, December, last December's poll is because that we have not listened to their uh, aspirations, to their grievances, legitimate grievances. So this is an example. When I was in Afghanistan, the first thing I did, I went to the most remote areas like Nuristan, and and we, where there are no roads, you have to walk. No, you know, you cannot take a, no showers, no toilets, nothing. But those are the kind of conditions that you have to face in order to listen to the people. You just cannot be in the hotel, you know, Serena or Continental, and say, okay, now I'm 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 <laughs> or the embassy. Uh, and you can see that this is what I did a lot. Uh, even though I was not a government official, I was not sponsored by anybody, but just for my own sake, to make sure that uh, whatever we, I do is based on something that the people want, and to establish the rapport that is necessary to be uh, with the people of Afghanistan. And, and you can see a different era that we have these discussions, these talks, and, and, and I spent a lot of my time uh, listening to the people and talking with the people, and I learned from that. I learned a great deal from what needs to be done, and what and this is a model that we should uh, use. Now, I think uh, even now we don't have a national vision for Afghanistan, and I challenge anybody who says that we have to produce it, like this the President Obama's strategy. We have yet to see it. <laughs> We know it's there, but uh, only the military aspect we have seen, but the overall strategy, I don't think that anybody has seen. First, we have to have a national vision for Afghanistan. We, and, and in order to do that, we have to include the Afghans in the process. And these are the, some of the challenges. I'm going to skip this. I think we are running. So I think I go to what needs to be done. As the national vision has to be developed through a consensus development process. It has to come from Afghans. It cannot be imposed on Afghans because whatever is going to impose is going to uh, not be sustainable. And in a few years, we have to change, and, and the people are going to uh, abandon with that aspiration or whatever it is. We need to you know, sever our relationship with these unsavory characters. If we are there to help the Afghan people, we need to forge good relationship, meaningful relationship with the Afghan people. Yes, we use these unsavory characters to, to um, get rid of Taliban and evil power, but if, if this means that the Afghan people are hostage to these unsavory characters for the rest of their lives, I don't think that we are going to succeed. So, because these people only commit atrocities, only commit bad things to the people, just for their own benefit. And, and believe me, they don't even know what their benefit is. Because if they knew, uh, in reality, they wouldn't do these things. Because they have a very narrow perspective. They are brought up during the war era. All they knew is killing um, in, in those atrocities. And we need to require effective governance in Afghanistan. Without a credible partner, I don't think that we can succeed. And uh, a lot of uh, journalists, a lot of analysts uh, are in agreement on that, but unfortunately, we are we were unable to deliver on this, and we are still unable to do this. You know, from Afghan perspective, when the U.S. says that we cannot achieve this, then they say, well, if you are so helpless that you cannot, you know, uh, uh, form a government that is your puppet, then how can you come and tell me what to do, the Afghans? So they will, they will, you will lose our credibility to, to, for Afghanistan. Because the Afghans think differently. So we have to show that we have the courage, the wisdom, and the guts to, to make sure that we take effective action on these. And with this kind of a government, I don't think that any action that we do is going to be successful. Because what we are going, trying to do now is we have assumed that this government is there, that now we are trying to compensate for it, and, and uh, it's not going to work. 
Because look what happened to Marja. We, we brought a, an administrator now that we know that he was, uh, he stabbed his son when he was in Germany and he was in prison for four years. Can you imagine that we cannot find one good individual without, with a clean record to be, and this is a showcase, believe me, you just made this to the showcase, and with a showcase we have a, we select an individual like that. He may be a good person, I don't know, because some Afghans, because of their conflict in terms of their adjustment to the Western uh, ways of living, I think they made some things that, uh, thinking that they were still in Afghanistan, but I think it's totally inappropriate to bring somebody like this uh, after we have made it known to the world that now we got, we bring the cleanest government and the best people, and then the administrator of Marja is somebody, and, and now we are, we are trying to defend that. So I think that's a bad governance. We need to uh, really pay attention to the Afghan National Army and National Police. I think give, given the fact that we did not listen to, the Afghan, uh, to Afghans, and we didn't know the context of Afghanistan. We came up with a military system that is totally inappropriate for Afghanistan. From one perspective, from social justice perspective, the people who are in the military are the poorest of the poor in Afghanistan. We ask them to stake their lives for a few people who are getting rich. So if my son you know, is in the military because uh, of, you know, $80 or $100 or 120 because they are making a living, because I have no other options, otherwise I will not be in the military. And I go and kill, you know, to be killed, to keep these few people who are getting rich, that's not going to work. In Afghanistan, every Afghan is obligated to defend for the homeland. And this, this is the mentality, this is the context, context the historical context in Afghanistan. I don't know who changed this all of a sudden that we have this kind of an army. So with this, so if you have, if you listen to Afghans, I think we can come up with the systems that are going to be workable. And I think we need to work in terms of the needs of a reconstruction, and we have to do it effectively. We cannot do it with a system where 80, 90 percent of our dollars are wasted by estimate, which I have done. Some people. Uh, uh, the U.S. effectiveness uh, the, in terms of its aid is between 10 to 15 percent. And with that kind of effectiveness, most of our dollars are wasted, meaning that uh, the taxpayers, we have to pay for it, and it goes to, uh, not to the purposes that were intended for, and so there is a lot of waste fraud. So we need to bring a monitoring system that is effective, and, in, and we know what total quality or quality improvement is now, so that over, we have to make refinements to the system as we get the feedback, and, and those uh, systems are available in this country. We know the technology, we know that we, the know-how is there, but we need to apply it in a meaningful way in Afghanistan. I just want to, uh, how much time do we have? Um, about one more minute. Okay. <clears throat> um, the story that I uh, kind of tell in the, in the book, uh, it was based on my own experiences when I was uh, running the National Airlines for Afghanistan. And I saw how corrupt the system was. I knew there was corruption. But when I got into the system and I saw how much of corruption there was at high levels, believe me, the things that were achievements um, were considered to be um, acts of treason, acts of crime from those people because they didn't want to see the, they didn't want the national airline to succeed because of their self-interest. Because, and, and if you read the um, Washington Post article. I think you can, some of that now is clear, you know, why they didn't want the National Airline to succeed. But, well, of course, um, I, I, I had uh, made a decision to, to work in that manner, but I didn't know that the reper repercussions would be such huge. I thought they would say, okay, step aside, we don't want this kind of, but, uh, so in the book, I, I try to um, give realistic pictures of what happened in my own case, as an example. And with that kind of a system, I don't think that we can succeed. 
And, and the ma major motive, major uh, uh, motivation for the book was that so that I could tell the story. But then, of course, I didn't want to be completely negative then I, uh, because there are a lot of misconceptions about Afghanistan and, and that's something that I want to allude to. For example, a lot of policymakers, they said there was no state uh, ever as an Afghanistan uh, completely contradicting history. Afghanistan a rich history of 5,000 years um, uh, where there is always a state. Of course, the name uh, has changed over the, um, the years. And they say that, for example, that the government never ruled Afghanistan. This is totally wrong, and, 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 and there are some episodes in the book that shows that this was wrong. For example, my father was a governor of Paktia province, and, and, and he was a military person, but um, there was complete rule in, in Paktia, where now we have problems like host which is one fra fra fraction of Paktia province. And in those days, um, nobody was uh, outside the realm of law in Afghanistan. And they, they said there was a culture of, of corruption. This is totally wrong, Afghanistan. There was no culture of corruption. Of course, in every government, there is some um, degree of corruption. But Afghanistan was a relatively clean government. And that's why those achievements were possible with meager resources. And, uh, so I hope that by reading the books, some of these misconceptions and myths about Afghanistan are also resolved. And, and since uh, we are running short of time, I'm going to stop my presentation and we'll welcome any questions and comments that you have. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Tosh. Those are uh, really appreciate those remarks. Um, you know, personally, I always found uh, find uh, the, the personal stories uh, you know the most compelling um, and, and so uh, intriguing and interesting. Uh, but along the same lines, it's also important that we have uh, you know journalists and individuals that capture the story when people can't actually speak for themselves. And our next uh, uh, author and speaker, uh, Dr. I'm sorry, Roy Goodman, has uh, a history of doing that. Um, he's currently the foreign affairs journalist. Uh, uh, he's been a foreign affairs journalist in Washington for over four decades. Currently, he's a foreign affairs editor for McClatchy, and he's a former uh, senior fellow at the U.S. Institute for Peace. Um, his reports on ethnic cleansing in Bosnia-Herzegovina uh, won the Pulitzer Prize in international reporting in 1993. Uh, was also the recipient for that work for the George Polk Award and the Selden Ring Award for investigative reporting. Uh, in 2002, he was a co-winner of the Edgar Allan uh, Poe Award for White House Correspondents Association, and in 2003, the National Headliner's first prize for magazines. Formerly with Reuters, Newsday, Reuters, Newsday, and Newsweek, he is the author of uh, numerous books, including Banana Diplomacy, uh, Witness to Genocide, and uh, co-editor of Crimes of War, What the Public Should Know. Uh, today, he's here to speak with us about his latest book, his latest work, How We Missed the Story, Osama bin Laden, the Taliban, and the Hijacking of Afghanistan. Uh, so, Roy. It's an honor to be here today and to help celebrate <coughs> Nadir's uh, new book. Um, and I really appreciate CSAS for organizing this. Um, Turbulence, it's a terrific title. Um, uh, and it sums up so much about Afghanistan of uh, the last uh, 30 years. Um, and I do agree uh, that, the, uh, that memoirs of this kind, which really tell a story uh, and uh, expose it and put it right before you and uh, give you the experience, are just uh, invaluable. Uh, uh, for getting insights <clears throat> into uh, what's what's going wrong and, and maybe how to put it right, uh, I must say Ariana Airlines uh, needs you uh, back, so <laughs> please reconsider. In fact, the whole airline industry in uh, in Afghanistan really needs you. Um, I wanted to deal with one aspect of uh, the turbulence <clears throat> uh, that uh, is the topic of uh, uh, Nader's book. Um, and that is uh, the rule of law issue. And I wanted to deal with the uh, issue at the very highest uh, level <clears throat> of uh, the violation of the rule of law. Um, and just to say a, a couple of obvious things, uh, but sometimes they're not always so obvious. <clears throat> uh, 
Afghanistan uh, is, a, is a country, by the way, in my own career, which has fascinated me from uh, going back, certainly, to the uh, Soviet invasion period. Um, but it's a country that's been at war for 30 years. Uh, it's a place which has a lot, and a lot of history occurred during those 30 years. And much of it was not recorded uh, by us in the uh, Western media. Um, and even historians have, I think, uh, given relatively short shrift to uh, significant periods in uh, Afghanistan's recent history, um, which is why I did the book uh, about the 1990s, which I thought was the biggest <clears throat> vacuum in, uh, the, in the history of uh, Afghanistan from the Western uh, perspective, um, and tried to reconstruct a series of those wars. But there have been, um, in, in, in wars that, a series of wars, actually five wars uh, by my count, <clears throat> uh, there's a lot of history that many people would like to forget. Uh, for the, uh, and it's, it's, it's principally the, the crimes that occurred in those wars. Uh, for the victims of those crimes, for the survivors though, forgetting it is not easy. Uh, what was done to people uh, in, by definition of just having fallen into a group, uh, be it to Hazara, be it to Pashtuns, be it to Tajiks, or to anybody, uh, collective punishment rankles. The sore festers, and as we know from the former Yugoslavia, uh, it carries on from generation to generation um, as oral history. Uh, the original crime is often magnified many times from its, from its uh, uh, actual size. Um, and especially if there's been no exhaustive investigation, no judicial process for resolving it, no agreement on what happened, who was responsible, uh, who were the victims, who were the perpetrators. Um, my contention is from my study of the 1990s in particular, um, and really going up to this day, is that impunity uh, on these massive, uh, on these the atrocities of war <clears throat> uh, is one of the bigger problems of uh, Afghanistan today. Uh, and it's all the bigger because no one in power will acknowledge it. Uh, and there seems to be nobody outside including the United States, who wants to force this uh, into uh, the realm of public discussion and, and actually uh, uh, resolve, resolve it. As I say, there are five wars. Uh, they, uh, the first one is familiar to everybody who's seen Charlie Wilson's war, uh, the uh, <clears throat> war against uh, the Russian occupation from 1979 to 18, 1989. The second was the war from 89 to 92 to unseat the proxy government left behind by the Russians. 1992 to 96, the civil war between the Mujahideen, who actually were installed, uh, this is uh, Ahmed Shah Massoud and uh, Burhanuddin Rabani, who were installed uh, with support from the State Department, I should tell you, uh, between them and the Pakistani-backed uh, uh, Mujahideen groups, uh, including Hekmatyar who were supported by Pakistan's uh, ISI intelligence uh, network uh, uh, agency <clears throat> and by extension by the CIA. So you had the State Department on the one side and the CIA basically backing the other. <clears throat> uh, the war between 1996 and 2001 was between the Taliban who tried to conquer the, the entire country but were never able actually to vanquish the remnants of the Mujahideen government of Massoud. And then finally, you have the war from 2001 to this day uh, between the Karzai government or the government that the United States helped install uh, and the remnants of the Taliban regime. Five wars. It's really quite a record um, in modern history. <clears throat> um, the American attitude in, uh, the issue, on the issue of the crimes that have occur occurred in these wars uh, is really, to me, surprising. Uh, throughout uh, these wars, and in some cases the CIA was the major agency of the U.S. government uh, involved, certainly in the 79 to 89 period, <clears throat> uh, and at times it's been the State Department that's uh, carried the lead, uh, but it, the policy has been on the whole pretty empty, um, that uh, throughout this, this period uh, the U.S. attitude has been very consistent. We've shown no interest whatsoever <clears throat> in the crimes and atrocities, uh, some of which bordered on genocide, certainly in the Taliban period. Uh, nothing, uh, little was written or said about what Soviets did to Afghans in the, uh, in the 1980s. Uh, and almost nothing was written about what Afghans did to captured Soviet soldiers. 
Uh, my book begins uh, when the Russians pulled out in 1989, <clears throat> and when I think the modern era uh, really began. <clears throat> um, and I tried to, uh, to record every allegation uh, of, uh, of violations of the laws of uh, armed conflict um, and, and to find out what had happened about what the international community did about them, if anything. Uh, the, uh, the, the very first of the major atrocities was in 1997, and this was when the Taliban uh, tried to conquer the north of Afghanistan, uh, it went to Mazari Sharif, they set up, uh, they created uh, a kind of a uh, new government, uh, they imposed Sharia law, they acted like conquerors, but they stepped into a trap of their own making and they fell into it. Thousands of their troops were captured by a local warlord. This was not General Dostum, uh, who's pretty famous for, uh, as a warlord who's committed all sorts of uh, crimes. This was actually the guy who overthrew Dostum at the time, um, a man named uh, Malik uh, Paklovan. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the, the UN saw this as one of these things you will, when you have, when it happens, you've got to do something right away. You put the spotlight on it, you investigate it, you send out people, and you try to get uh, everybody to agree to what's happened, and then you try to uh, identify the culprits and, um, and what happens next. Uh, we're just discovering, and even in the case of Yugoslavia, not, not, not that much happens, but at least the facts are known. And in this case, the UN tried to do that very thing. Uh, the UN's investigator was the first person on the scene. He said that he could see that thousands of Taliban prisoners were lined up and mowed down with heavy caliber machine guns. <clears throat> but there was no investigation, no formal investigation. The US government refused to put any money into a UN probe <clears throat> because we, were not, we didn't want to do anything to help the Taliban. And maybe that was a motive at the time. 1998, the Taliban again went back to Mazari Sharif. This time, they were carried. They were determined to carry out a slaughter of the people who they blamed for the uh, massacre the previous year, uh, but actually who, who were not directly to blame. That's the Hazara. And so they they basically uh, went out, ordered from the very top the the rounding up of Hazara, uh, the ex execution in the streets, leaving the bodies for the dogs to get at. Uh, the whole thing was organized by the Taliban, and it was an atrocity. It was a massacre. At least 2,000 people were killed. Maybe the number was even higher. The Clinton administration remained completely silent. There was never an investigation. And I'd say to, the re to my regret as a journalist that journalists didn't do their job adequately, with a few exceptions, didn't cover it, didn't follow up, didn't really uh, bring out the facts. Um, in late 2000, and so that was uh, in the period where the Taliban were the dominant uh, uh, force in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, after 9-11, the United States sent in forces, and with the help of a resurgent uh, uh, force of General Dostum and the remnants of Ahmed Shah Massoud's forces, uh, basically uh, forced the Taliban out of power, and the Taliban rushed out of power in Afghanistan. Governments don't usually wait around to be defeated. They escape uh, to live in a, and to fight another day. Uh, and that's what the Taliban did, and that's what they're doing right now, as you know. <clears throat> um, and when the, the U.S. Uh, and Dostum's people captured thousands of Taliban around Kunduz, and then transported, they, they transported them to a way station, um, and, uh, and, and, then, and then General Dostum uh, reloaded them into container trucks. Um, he sent them uh, uh, in these container trucks to a place called Dashti Lely. By coincidence, it's the same place where Dostum's uh, former uh, deputy had, uh, had put Taliban uh, corpses uh, in 1997. Um, and he, he, they, they loaded these container trucks, took them to Dashti Lely, people suffocated by the hundreds, maybe by the thousands, we've really never gotten the numbers, um, and, uh, and then dumped them into mass graves. Um, I was working on the story when I was in, in, at News, Newsweek, uh, and we went to the U.S. government again and again and again, both here and in Afghanistan. Um, there was no comment. There was no investigation. Sometime in the year 2008, and it might be a little bit earlier, it might be later, we don't know precisely, General Dostum ordered the removal of the graves. Um, uh, I was foreign editor uh, at McClatchy, a job I now have, um, and we sent a reporter to Dashti Lely. 
Um, and he went around to the site of the graves, which had been photographed uh, from satellites, and, um, and found that they were empty holes now. Scraps of clothing, human remains still scattered about. Uh, he went around to Dostum. Dostum was out of the country at that point, and he went around to Dostum's former deputies, all of whom said General Dostum ordered the exhumation of these graves. <clears throat> um, the U.S. military had no comment as we did the story. The U.S. Embassy refused to talk to our reporter. The Afghan government, the Afghan military also had no comment. Now, what is the relevance of these crimes to today? Uh, I mean, I'm not just trying to give you, uh, you know, the, the sordid side of a Afghan history, <clears throat> but it's because it, I, I'm convinced that it is very relevant. Um, while I was in Kabul this uh, past January, I went around and asked that question of uh, people who either knew the Taliban perspective or had a sense of the Western perspective or just knew something about Afghan history. So here's one view. Uh, Vahid Mojdeh, some of you may know him. He's a former Taliban official. Uh, he's uh, friendly to the Afghan government. He supports the Afghan constitution, but he has good lines out to the Taliban uh, leadership. And this is what he said. That massacre, and he's referring to the 2001 massacre at Dasht Leili, was the basis, was the foundation for all the fighting that is now going on. And he said, General Dostum did this work. I went then to the US military, just to, because I thought this was a fairly interesting summing up of relevance. And I asked, what do you think of, the, um, uh, of this statement by Mr. Mojdeh? And to my amazement, uh, American officials at the very heights of the uh, military uh, basically said they agreed. And I'll give you a quote. I, I, I talked to this general, but it was uh, on background, so I can't give you his name. The massacre, he said, has absolutely increased Taliban motivation. Those kinds of things just thicken the hatred and cause more people to join the Taliban. As for General Dostum, he said, when leaders like that, leaders, quote unquote, like that, do stupid things like that, they only serve to hurt what we're trying to do out here. So a footnote, General Dostum, <clears throat> uh, far from, uh, he had been in exile for a while because he had been beating up people and, uh, and uh, getting out of control. Uh, General Dostum <clears throat> has now been appointed chief of the Afghan army by Karzai. And sometime in January, without any public debate, and at a point that parliament was not in session, President Karzai is reported to have issued yet another amnesty for uh, Dostum and all the others against whom war crimes charges could be placed. I say is reported to have because nobody really knows for sure whether uh, this uh, amnesty has, uh, has been issued and taken, and taken effect. Anyway, my conclusion is that the, re the problem remains hidden, but it is a lethal one. And it's at the center of bringing stability to Afghanistan and preparing the way for an American exit. If the Afghans won't address it, and I think for various political reasons the Karzai government's not going to, the United States should. If the United States won't, well, then perhaps the International Criminal Court should. Someone should take this up. <clears throat> I'm not saying that this is going to end the turbulence of uh, 30 years, um, but it could certainly help. Thank you. Well, thank you both for those very, uh, uh, you know, intriguing and, and compelling remarks. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, get right into questions. Again, we have microphones throughout the room. Um, I'll go ahead and ask the uh, the first question, though, um, and it'll be to both the, the speakers here. Um, you both touched on an issue, at least a theme that I picked up, uh, of credibility and how important that is um, to, to success in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, so I would like to know um, uh, there's issues regarding the credibility of the Karzai government. Um, what needs to be done, what can be done about that, um, and, and who needs to be involved in that process? So, uh, uh, Dr. Tosh, we'll, we'll start with you, sir. Uh, I think that we should have been proactive on that issue, um, to make, making sure that the president, presidential elections were fair, open, and, and, and just for all people. We didn't do that. so. We know that there was massive uh, fraud, and as a result of that fraud, uh, President Karzai got elected. So the issue is what should we do now to enhance the credibility of already of a, of a sort of a tainted president? I don't think that we can restore it completely, but at least we can 
uh, uh, enhance it to the extent that we have adequate uh, credibility and, uh, and legitimacy from the eyes of the Afghans. The first thing that we should do is demand from President Karzai and persuade him in a very friendly way that he should appoint a credible, competent, and uh, dedicated people. The problem in Afghanistan now is that, and, and I've been challenged by some Afghans, to show me one individual that is not in the payroll of a foreign government that is in the cabinet. So that's the kind of, a, whether this is tr truth or not, that's the perception in Afghanistan. And with that perception, do you think that the Afghans would follow that kind of a government? And the second thing is that uh, we need to deliver on the services for the people very quickly. And, and I think uh, the issue that uh, uh, Mr. Gutman raised is a very important issue. Somehow we have to hold these people uh, that have committed crimes. And I'm not only talking about war crimes, about uh, economic crimes, about uh, massive uh, things that have been done in this in these few years, I think we need to hold them accountable, and I think those things would uh, at least restore some of this lost accountability, and I think um, at least to the extent that we have a workable government. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Governor? Uh, the, um, I, I was very fascinated while I was there. I was very fascinated while I was there to see uh, the parliament uh, actually acting up and acting like a parliament and rejecting um, many of the nominations uh, of President Karzai for his new government as a kind of a protest against his uh, legitimacy. Uh, I think they made some, <laughs> some errors. They, they, they knocked out some good people, and, uh, but they also knocked out some people who never should have been on the list anyway. Um, and they did it, did it twice. And I went to uh, one or two parliamentary debates, and I, I was really quite impressed by the uh, openness uh, of, their, uh, of their discussion and their open criticism. I mean, for a parliament that had been really in the pocket of President Karzai um, all along, that uh, th these guys were really angry. They were, and, and, and I thought the basis of their anger was uh, that, uh, that the president himself, uh, his own legitimacy was in question. Um, and the one thing that, the one ray of hope maybe that you could have in, in a system uh, of such uh, that, that has has not really worked uh, there, is that uh, the parliament could become uh, could could actually do its job as a uh, as an equal branch of government. Uh, now the problem is uh, they're about to have elections. Uh, Karzai wanted to do it actually as early as May. Um, and he was going to stack uh, the, the uh, deck once again uh, and try to uh, see that his people got elected everywhere. Um, and the parliament resisted that, uh, as did the international community. Um, and that election now is slated, I think, for the end of this year. Uh, and once again, President Karzai is, uh, is trying his very best to, uh, to load uh, uh, the decks uh, uh, in his favor. Uh, this is something where the international community has a voice. It's also something where the Afghans have a voice where, uh, and where the parliament has a voice. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a, a play in progress. Um, I think the one thing you could hope for in this period while uh, Karzai is president is uh, for a parliament uh, that actually uh, does its job um, and, and starts to expose uh, corruption uh, and so on. One of the fascinating things to me is that um, representatives, even if they didn't get elected completely uh, in the most uh, uh, honest way, and this goes, oh, actually I've been in Iraq as well, uh, a, another nascent uh, democratic system, is that they, they still have to represent their constituents, or their constituents expect them to represent them. And that when something goes very wrong, as it did in the, uh, in the national elections, uh, constituents come to the uh, members of parliament and, and complain. And, then the, and, and if, there, if the complaints rise enough, uh, you know, there, there, is, there is that thing. And so with all the flaws of the system that are there, and there are many that were created in, this, in the Bonn conference, um, that may be the one, the one little glimmer of hope. Great. Great. Thank you uh, both so much. Okay, we'll go to the audience for, uh, for questions. Uh, right, right here in the middle, the microphone. Again, please state your name and your, and your affiliation and a uh, question. Thank you. My name is Dr. Warner Anderson. I'm with the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Defense for Health Affairs, the International Health Division. My question primarily is to Dr. Atash. This, this, is, going to, this is going to be a tough question, but you wanted the military to ask Afghans the questions, so here goes. Um, we, I think we all believe that all development, 
all projects in Afghanistan need to be sustainable. How do you achieve sustainability in a nation that has virtually no tax base and whose major product seems to be illegal in all countries, including Afghanistan? Uh, I think here again, your question is uh, premised on, on misconceptions and myths about Afghanistan. Just go back to 30 years ago in Afghanistan, prior to the, we had quite a, uh, many projects that were sustainable, and a lot of projects done only with Afghan uh, resource. Think of, for example, the Kabul Jalalabad Road, this new road, the Mahipar. The engineers were Afghans, the workers were Afghans, and this was completely an Afghan project. No foreign assistance whatsoever uh, committed to that. So the fact that those projects were sustainable, and even the projects that were done with the assistance from other countries, the major player, major conduit were Afghans, and the projects were designed by Afghans, uh, and uh, with the support and help of US, USSR, Germany, and other countries. And those projects are still, some of them are working. Look at Surubi uh, uh, Hydroelectric. This was um, you know, one of the oldest uh, projects in the hydroelectric uh, in Afghanistan. It's still working. Uh, the Naglu, uh, which is, um, in the Maipar, which is a German, Managlu was a, was a Russian. All of these projects were sustainable, um, plus many more projects. I think that the way that we can make projects sustainable, first, those projects have to be relevant and needs to be fit uh, with the national goals. And I have experience with small projects. That's why we went to those people. And I have projects in Nuristan, for example, through Nuristan Foundation now, that's still running, for example, small hydroelectric uh, projects. The way we did the projects was we sat with the people and said, okay, what do you really need in this uh, community? And then they would identify their, their needs, and then we say, okay, now what is your contribution to that? Because it's gonna benefit your, you know, improve your life, and what do you really actually do not have that we can provide you? And through this cooperative, uh, 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 ventures with the people, I think the projects were much more sustainable. Uh, some of the projects, unfortunately, were done very quickly in, in, in those days, and through, especially through the National Solidarity Program. Uh, that was a good program, but I think some of the, those things were done because just to accomplish things in, in remote areas and, and, and provinces. And I think we can do it, provided that we have a credible Afghan government, and, and there is no corruption, and, and that it fits the national uh, vision and national uh, plan. Great, thank you. Um, we'll go right here to the front in the red, red shirt. Uh, Stanley Cobra with the Cato Institute for Dr. Atash. Um, you said we should demand of President Karzai that such and so. Let's say we demand it, and he tells us to go jump in a lake. So what's the threat? What do we have that is so intimidating that he would submit to our demand? From, let me answer that from an Afghan perspective. The Afghans say, who brought President Karzai into power? And who is keeping him in power? The fact that we cannot do anything about it, whether that's real or imaginary, from an Afghan perspective, that's something that's kind of baloney. So you're saying we should have a coup? Well, let me tell you. There are mechanisms in the law for this. <clears throat> and, and I have advocated those publicly, and I got into trouble on that. For example, uh, what do you do when, when a president breaches the, the Constitution? By my count, and I'm not an attorney, 26 items of the Constitution were breached by this president. Some of them act of omission, some out, uh, act of commission. So there is ample, reason, ample justification to proceed on impeachment if you want to do that. And it's not coup. Cool. Actually, it will be. Uh, but I think if, we, if you're serious enough, President Karzai will listen, and, and, and he, he, uh, he will be the last person to, to resist 
that temptation. I think we should have a good exit strategy for him, and that is a very good exit strategy if he doesn't deliver and deliver on time. The problem is, I think, that some of the U.S. people are really cozy with him, and I don't know which, I, I'm not an expert on the U.S. Uh, thing, whether it's uh, CIA or DIA or whatever it is, but some of those people are really wor working very close with him and are telling him that, yes, go stay on this course, nobody's going to do anything with you. So first we have to get our act together and come up with a, with a, a strategy that we really mean, that mean business. And I think if we cannot deliver on that strategy, then on that point, uh, the, we shouldn't send more troops, we shouldn't increase the resources because when you all waste it and, and we are really going to, uh, my, you know, my kind of worst scenario case is that the U.S. is going to kill one million Afghans in the next year and a half if this situation uh, is not changed. And what is going to happen is we are going to spend billions of dollars, probably $200 billion in the process in a couple of years and, 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 and achieve nothing. I think the best thing would be, then if that's the case, we should pull out. That's a, a much better strategy than, than continuing on this course where we, we are going to kill innocent Afghans and achieve nothing. We'll go to, uh, to Mr. Goodman. Do you want to respond to that? Well, uh, we, he is our guy. We created him. We put him in there. Uh, and uh, the whole process of doing these things uh, usually comes a cropper. I mean, uh, not, <laughs> Afghanistan is, not, is only the latest example uh, of that. Uh, y you do want the Afghan people to have their voice. And uh, obviously what happened at the Bonn conference was a uh, you know, quick fix that, uh, was, uh, that just left, left the country uh, in some years down the road in a very messy political situation. I have to disagree with uh, Dr. Atash on the, uh, on the, uh, the remedy. Uh, I think Afghanistan is more than Karzai. Uh, I think the stability of Afghanistan is a uh, fundamentally important thing for uh, American security and for the security of South Asia and the security of the Middle East. I think if, uh, if the government, uh, creaky though it is, uh, is defeated, if the Taliban uh, come back into power, <clears throat> you are going to have a situation where uh, Afghanistan becomes an, a, a magnet as it was uh, during the 19, latter 1990s uh, for uh, jihadis uh, from all around uh, the Islamic world. Uh, yeah. But in fact, you're going to ha but it's going to be even uh, more intense because uh, this will be uh, to a Taliban uh, government that can claim to have defeated the United States, uh, the West, uh, everybody. Uh, so I think we have to bear that in mind as we deal with, as, as the United States deals with Karzai. Uh, uh, it's very interesting. I'm not quite sure myself which American uh, uh, institution or uh, body or agency is dealing uh, with Karzai very positively. I couldn't find one while I was there. Um, certainly uh, at the State Department, they're all in disagreement with him. The U.S. ambassador is uh, often at sword's points with him. Uh, the, uh, General McChrystal is uh, by default almost the person who sees him the most and who seems to get along the most uh, uh, decently with him, but doesn't have an easy time at all. Um, you have to find workarounds. I think you have to keep an eye on the big picture here and, uh, and, and, and withdrawal uh, uh, in any short-term way uh, and leaving the country to, to collapse, I, I think, would be an utter disaster. Let me just, I, I don't think that I meant that we should withdraw. Well, my point is, we, I agree that this is a critical place and we need to succeed. And for order to succeed, we need a credible African government. And my thesis is that without that, we are not going to succeed. So well, we have to make sure that we, we get it right on that issue. And I don't see any problem why we cannot achieve that, because I see it as a very simple process, and I don't see it as a very complicated, given the persuasions that we have. And I give one example, I think we can achieve that end. And so, yes, we should achieve, uh, uh, be persistent, be persuasive, and make sure that we achieve that. Okay, let's go with, uh, with, with one more question. We'd like to, to end on time. The gentleman right here on the right-hand side of the room in the gray suit. Thank you. Frank Kenefick. I'm with Beacon Technology, a member of the Afghan Advocacy Group for quite some time. I was previously with the State, uh, the USAID, the State Department, and the World Bank for 40 years. 
my connection to Afghanistan goes back to the early 70s when we worked on uh, the Helmand uh, Valley program, the Kajuki Dam uh, Engineering uh, uni uh, School of uh, Kabul University, etc. I had a supporting, minor supporting role in the cross-border program, uh, Charlie Wilson's war, and was called out of retirement early 2003 to lead the U.S. government program's flagship, the reconstruction of the Kabul Kandahar Highway. Uh, we demined, reconstructed, fought with the Taliban, and laid down 250 miles of asphalt in 250 days, a world record, and much of that was because of Afghans helping us. Thank you. On the issue of sustainability, and I think Dr. Gutman's point about five wars in Afghanistan, I believe there's a sixth war, and some of us have sort of touched on that in this room. Uh, I am a known critic of my own government here because I've seen it, uh, not as Dr. Atash says, with the courage and wisdom to do what's right and the guts to pursue that. I've seen infighting in the U.S. government go on now for seven years. There was a very good start up through late 2005. But the infighting in the U.S. government, I can guarantee I worked in poppies in Thailand, Laos, Turkey, coca in Latin America. Uh, I have a background in the things that people... I'm sorry, sir. We're running short on time. Can you can I get to ask okay. the question, please? But my, my point is this. Until the U.S. public pressures its own government to get the plan right, General McChrystal and all my former good military colleagues and others are not going to be able to win. That isn't the war. When the Russians came in in 79, there were 2 million landless Afghans out of 14 million. 80% of the infrastructure and economy was destroyed. When we returned, there were 10 million landless Afghans. And that's what they're looking for, and it ain't government. Thank you. Uh, sir, was there a question to that? The, the question is, how do we get our government, Dr. Atash, to do what you're saying needs to be done? Okay. The U.S. government. I, I think um, I see some positive um, developments, especially with the election of President Obama, that he opened up this uh, issue in terms of w why we are there and how we can achieve. And in terms of I know there was a great deal of work to strategize uh, for Afghanistan, but I think that's not enough because uh, uh, I believe that the in the formulation and, and the implementation and assessment of the strategy, Afghans need to be an integral part of that. That's why we need credible Afghan government and, and, and all Afghans to be part of that strategy. I think it, uh, in terms of the uh, formulation and implementation, there is inadequate Afghan presence from that, uh, in that process. Uh, secondly, we need to do more in terms of uh, winning the hearts and minds of Afghans. And I don't think that uh, it will be, the PRTs would be uh, adequate for that. PRTs serve their purposes when we had emergency kind of situation in Afghanistan. There was no government and they uh, uh, so, and there was corruption, basically. So we need to c come up with mechanisms for delivering services and economic development so that Afghans see improvement in their lives. And I think there are ways that we can do this. How do we move the, Afghan, the U.S. government? And of course, this is a democracy, and what we are having here is it's it's an example of that. I think this is going to influence uh, our thinking first, and we, are, we can uh, develop consensus amongst ourselves, different circles. That's why I devote a lot of my time to meetings like this, and, and I believe uh, that eventually it will have its effects. And I, I'm one that I really uh, um, advocate, and, and you are part of the Afghanistan Advocacy Group. We work together on the involvement of the U.S. in Afghanistan, but I want it to be uh, you know, constructive, and meaningful and fruitful for all of us. And I think the, uh, we can achieve that if you work together. Uh, Mr. Gruppen, I'll give you the last word, if you have anything to add to that. Well, I, I think that the U.S. for the longest time has treated Afghanistan as an object and has seen it as not as a real country but as a platform for attacking somebody else or defending something. 
Um, and I think that the beginning of wisdom would be, uh, well, we have to absolutely have to listen to Afghans, uh, and, and this uh, memoir is, is an example of, of an Afghan we should be listening to. Uh, but we have to treat the country as a real place. It's, it's true they have no oil. It's true that they're, re but they have a lot of other resources, and their human resources are really incredible. Afghans, uh, the, the character of Afghans is really, as you know yourself, really something to behold, and they can be some of the great people, and they can do great things. We, we have to look at it as a real place, uh, and a place where we're going to be committed to help them until they get it straightened out. Well, great. Um, uh, we thank you both for your remarks. I think we have copies of the books available uh, for sale in the back. Um, but we'd like to thank both of these speakers uh, for those uh, tremendous remarks. Thank you. Thank you.